Welcome and thank you again for joining us this afternoon for NAFSA's author talk and I'm delighted that I have David Di Maria joining me by phone. Um, many of you know David. He is a Senior International Officer and Associate Vice Provost for International Education at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. David is also currently the NAFSA International Education Leadership Knowledge Community Chair and serving as faculty member for NAFSA's Executive Internationalization Leadership E-Institute. So you wonder when he gets time to write a book uh, if he's not busy enough. Um, but David holds a doctorate from the University of Minnesota where he studied internationalization from a P16 perspective. He is the editor of two other NAFSA books, Managing a Successful International Admissions Office, NAFSA's Guide to International Admissions, and Senior, uh, NAFSA's Guide to International Admissions, and the Senior International Officers Essential Roles and Responsibilities book. Um, again, we're delighted to have David here with us and shortly we'll begin our um, conversation with the author himself. Um, before we start, we have a very quick poll that I would appreciate if you could fill out. Okay, a few more minutes. There we go. You'll see the poll results. Uh, many of you are direct service, management strategy, direct service is 53% of the audience today. And um, do you have a centralized office or not? It's almost equal, 45% centralized office, 39% decentralized. And then how many staff members make up your office? Majority of you, 58% have two to 10 staff members uh, within your office. So thank you for filling that out. Um, so I'll start off with my first question for David. Um, if you would, David, can you give us a quick overview of the book and what is systems thinking? Uh, we have it's restored on campus so I can have a video again. I'll stay on the phone though, just in case it uh, goes out. We... So really this book has been a, a work in progress uh, for a number of years in terms of the concept, um, the idea of applying systems thinking. And for those of you who are perhaps uh, scholars or scholar practitioners in international education, you know, uh, the late Joseph Messenhauser, a faculty member at the University of Minnesota. And, um, Dr. Messenhauser used to talk a lot about international education as this field where it's, it's, it's more of a system, it's, it's connected. If we think about um, this fall, many of you are maybe anticipating the arrivals of your um, new international students and what impact, um, say, does the COVID-19 have on that incoming class, say, if Australia, if it's um, harder or impossible to get there, uh, what is that, that impact and maybe what is the longer term impact, not just the immediate cause and effect, um, but say as agents and other partners maybe who would perhaps turn their attention elsewhere just out of necessity to help students find placements in other parts of the world. So systems thinking is really looking at interconnected parts and the relationships uh, among the various factors that would exist. It's not just looking at you know, a variable A contributed to outcome, you know, one, two, or three. Um, in terms of the book, it starts really with an overview of systems thinking because you want to have that mindset, you want to have that perspective and that um, really understanding as you approach uh, this topic of lean management. And then the uh, book progresses in some later chapters into the lean operations. And this is more of a strategic thinking, organizational development standpoint, these later chapters, thinking about organizational culture, anchor change to the institution and skills that my way, as well as making sure that we're all intentional. One big, um, uh, I would say, takeaway of, of lean management is that you don't want to do more. Uh, you, want, you just want to be effective. You want to do um, the minimum required to achieve the maximum results. And that may be in, misinterpreted by some colleagues. 
but you know the book's title is uh, it was really intentional in itself is that achieving more with less you don't necessarily need more staffing you know people don't agree with that you may not need more in your budget um, but it's looking at what you have and as opposed to focusing on what we could do if we had more you say well where are we expending our energy uh, where it's not really making the difference how can we redeploy some of the staff to focus on uh, areas that might have a, a greater impact than the work they're doing now. And so looking at the existing resources or even fewer resources and then achieving more in that regard. And there's a number of case studies in the book that um, try to make this not just theoretical, but very practical. And hopefully you know, everyone has a copy, they can you know, read through it and start to try to implement some of this in their office setting. Great, thank you. That, that's such an important point, David, in terms of thinking through lean management and applying those, actually. I think sometimes it's a little challenging for people to think, I don't need new staff, but I just need to evaluate and re-examine what's happening within our own processes and systems, right? And, and it can be overwhelming, but I will say that David's book does start small um, and think small first as a challenge to overcome some of the bigger questions and longer term issues and strategy. So you've, you've written several books now, David, what was the highlight of developing this book for you? So highlight, um, I'm not sure that's meant in a positive sense or just uh, what really stuck out. What stuck out is I had no idea going into this project that we were going to have this global pandemic take place. Uh, my plan was to be able to spend the summer of 2020 uh, really working on this uh, this book, and well, well, that didn't really happen, right? Um, in some ways, it was it was really trying to to crank it out um, over the academic year because the summer of 2020 was completely chaotic, and I know many colleagues were uh, experiencing similar challenges, but. I'd say highlight in terms of a positive sense um, was being able to really work with the NAFSA staff. Uh, if you haven't published with NAFSA, I would encourage you to approach them, approach any of the NAFSA colleagues here on the call. Um, they can walk you through the steps of you know, pitching your idea to really working out that first skeleton of an outline. And then they support you all along the way, um, all the way to the design of the cover. Um, so, I think that was the highlight is just, and that's why I, I've enjoyed publishing with NAFSA over the years. There are you know, different venues, different opportunities out there. But in my view, you know, as a scholar practitioner, um, I would say, you know, a book like this, hopefully it has an impact. Hopefully it helps colleagues um, to improve the operations in their, their units and achieve some of the goals that they've laid out. Um, and so if you're interested in publishing, work with NAFSA, and you know, that'll be your highlight too. I'm not being paid to say that. <laughs> well, thanks for that endorsement, David. It's, it's been lovely working with you on, on the various projects and books uh, throughout the years, likewise as well. So um, was there, during your process of writing and, and amongst the pandemic and everything else that uh, came crashing down, was there a particular person or institution that, you know, provided a unique case study for you as you wrote? Uh, the book? Yeah, I, I tried to use uh, examples from different institutions uh, where I've worked. And, you know, say certainly one colleague to look at is around value stream mapping and UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, where I, I currently work. And in that particular case study, I described this activity that we underwent. It was a, a partnership between uh, my office, uh, international office, and the Office of Admissions and the English Language Institute, uh, really trying to map out what happens, all the steps, all the decisions, any sort of delays that occur when an international undergraduate student applies to UMBC. And it was really the first time that you got these different units who were all integral to the process, um, including financial aid, they were at the table as well. Um, and being able to see that big picture, that big picture view of the student journey uh, through the admission system, uh, filling out the application, getting the, the Form I-20, um, being considered for scholarships, and just knowing from start to finish what is that like. And we literally 
you know, this is pre-COVID, literally uh, spent a few days in a room, uh, mapped out that process with a lot of sticky notes. We spent all of, you know, I don't know, $130 or whatever it was um, back then. Uh, and the impact was, you know, remarkable in the sense of the double digit percentage increase in students who were able to get through the funnel and actually enroll at the institution. And we were able to point um, to that, you know, isolating um, factors and all that, you know, that activity of removing some of the bottlenecks and, and what I would call maybe black holes that are present in, in our processes and are oftentimes um, undiagnosed in a way. Um, having that impact and, and making those changes, you know, really drove enrollment and continues to do so. Um, we, you know, knock on whatever my desk is made out, out of. Um, we're expecting a, a record incoming class this fall. And, um, you know, we're way above where we were in 2019 even. Um, certainly there's, you know, pent up demand. There's the issue with, you know, different nations being maybe more difficult to travel to study to. But even all that rolled out and put aside, um, I'd still say we would be way up and we're at like triple digit percentage increase uh, in that range. And, and we're not small, you know, small numbers of students here. Um, so that's a case study you might want to look at because it's something that you can try to replicate at your institution. And again, as long as you can get access to about $130 in 3M products, uh, you're able to do a value stream mapping activity. Now it's much more complicated in the current um, COVID environment. If you're not able to get people in the same room and trying to do it um, you know, virtually, that would be a, a bit of a, a challenge. But certainly, you know, check out that chapter, check out the case study in UMBC. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about that. Another uh, institution that I want to really give a shout out to is Kent State University, um, where I worked um, a little over 10 years ago. And that's where I got uh, really my start in this whole idea of, of lean management. You know, Ohio is a, a manufacturing state, and I had the opportunity there to participate in some professional certificate uh, training programs that were offered by Kent State, mostly meant for manufacturers and uh, hospitals and all, um, trying to be more efficient of creating products or getting patients through you know, an emergency room or whatever it might be. And I was at the time, I think the only uh, higher education administrator out of maybe a group of 30 or 40 people going through this intensive training. But I was able to take some of those concepts and really start to see it. And because at that time I was, in addition to other things, overseeing international admissions for eight campuses, which is a system in itself. Um, but being able to apply those concepts, the same that you would if you were manufacturing a car and getting it out in production and you know the car on the lot, uh, these same sorts of ideas of uh, doing, you know, um, what you can to achieve more with less and, and eliminate waste to get the application process and get that student enrolled and get the student in, you know, not in the parking lot, but in the classroom. Um, so that's really where a lot of this started out. Thank you. And, and what, how, how timely, right? I think um, everyone in international education has had to sacrifice, suffered um, personally, but also professionally. Um, so I think, you know, just thinking about systems thinking uh, and lean management is so appropriate to our time. What do you hope readers will take away from this book, David? So I hope, uh, you know, systems thinking is a discipline. That's what Peter Singe would say, a professor at MIT who writes a lot about this. Um, and I, I want, to, I want to, you know, stress that in the sense that you don't just read this book and become an expert overnight uh, in this. And I wouldn't say I'm an expert. I'd say I'm a lifelong learner on a lot of things. Um, you know, we're always trying to increase our knowledge and our skills, and, and there's always more to learn. Um, but systems thinking is something that, you know, if you, at least if you can be exposed to this. Each of those chapters, there's a whole body of literature that goes behind the chapter. And so view it as maybe um, choose one that resonates the most with you, uh, dig into it, look at some of the recommended readings, the references that are included uh, in the chapter, and then maybe for NAFSA regional conference, annual conference, or other you know, conferences, associations, start proposing some sessions on some of these topics and you become the expert. You, you give yourself six months, 12 months to 
really uh, brush up on this and being able to you know test it out uh, in your own office institutional setting uh, but i'm really hoping that colleagues walk away with again a practical tools that you can implement literally tomorrow uh, just as soon as you read the chapter and they might i know i've had some colleagues re reach out to me on linkedin they're using it in their staff meetings um you know monthly staff meetings you do a different chapter everybody reads it talk through it and uh, one of the probably great group activities is the um, the waste walk or the gimbal walk that i describe in the book where you literally go on a, a hunt looking for ways that you waste um, space you waste uh, money you waste time uh, and there's again uh, some models in there some tools that are included in the book that you can use that would guide this process in a, a very structured way. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I'll add that, you know, for those of us who are visual learners too, there are great um, visuals included in the book that, you know, help you visualize what it should look like in the process as you're planning these uh, exercises within your offices. So um, before we dive into the, the more content specific type information to share with the audience, I'd like to ask uh, the audience and remind you if you have a question for David, we'll have some time later on for Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A pod. Um, so now on to more content specific uh, topics, David. You frame the book around systems thinking, but what if I don't work in a system at all? What are the implications for a one person office? So I would say you do, everybody works in a system. Um, and when I do, when I've done some uh, current topics workshops for NAFSA over the years and tried to talk about uh, systems thinking, value stream mapping and all, one of the things I always have colleagues do is to look around that, um, that conference center workshop room and say, where do you see examples of systems? And usually people, you know, scratch their head and, you know, guess different things, but the HVAC system, right? Um, if you're in a hotel or a conference center and you're breathing the air coming out and let's say there's some sort of a, a intake uh, area where the air is coming in from the outside and someone's got a, truck that's uh, idling there, you're starting to smell those fumes or someone smoking or what have you. The fact that um, my author talk got a little delayed because of the electrical system today, right? That was a system. So we're all working in systems. At the same time, to again, make this a little more uh, concrete for you, as you think about your admissions process, that's a system. It's a sequence of steps that have to occur. You have to receive certain documents before you can move forward. You have to evaluate credentials uh, before you can make a, an informed decision on you know, the academic merits of an applicant. Uh, there's gonna be a number of IT related uh, issues that might result in delays. Maybe it's a 24 hour um, you know, refresh. Your student information system doesn't download information from the application system except for like at 3 a.m. in the morning uh, and you have to just wait uh, there's no way around that or maybe there is um, so understand just that we're all working in systems if you have a process that's a system in itself thank you and so if if someone wants to start like a or conduct a value stream mapping activity within their mm -hmm. office for the first time, what advice would you have for them? Uh, draft a disclaimer. That's, that's probably my first uh, piece of advice. No, I, I think, you know, all joking aside, read the chapter, get to know the steps, and I literally map it out for you how to, how to do this. It's a guide, you know, how to. Um, what you need, though, is someone who understands how to do this with experience. And you don't have to necessarily go hire someone to do this. You probably have experts on your campus. They might be in your College of Engineering. Um, they might be in your College of Business. Those tend to be the, the homes for um, lean management-minded individuals, you know, certain faculty who might even teach courses on this. And so that's a place to start. Or you, know, you bring someone in. The idea of um, really facilitating this process is you want to think about, you know, who the players are, and I get into this in the chapter. 
um, of, you know, and, and view it almost like a game or an activity in a fun way. Um, and so you might, you know, look at one third of practitioners, of admissions counselors, of um, DSOs, whoever those, uh, you know, frontline um, you know, processing staff would be who are touching the, the documents and touching the system. You might then think about a, another third of the participants or the players being the mid-level managers who are overseeing the, the teams or overseeing the units. And then, you know, you want to think about these outside experts who can come in, the registrar's office, whatever other unit can provide feedback to these students as well. Just to say in that critical view, I'm not an expert on credential evaluation. I'm not an expert on education abroad, uh, but I'm going to ask some questions because it's not making sense to me how you're, you know, why you're doing this. Um, and so that perspective is very important. And then the idea with value stream mapping is it's not a one and done activity. You actually, you actually want to do it twice initially in the sense that you map out the current state, what's the current process, because if you don't know the current process, you can't improve it. Uh, once you map it out, then you get ideas for improvement from the practitioners, from the stakeholders, not from you necessarily. And then you're mapping out again a future state. What are we going to work towards? And some of those could be overnight changes. Some of those you might have to have a few months of meetings to get people on board. And some of those might, you know, take longer. Uh, some IT system has to be developed or whatever it might be. And the other thing with value stream mapping is this idea of Kaizen. Uh, a lot of the terminology I have in the book is from the Japanese management because that's the Toyota production system. It's all about lean and has really um, uh, shown the path forward, at least in the business world, and I think there's implications for higher ed. Um, but Kaizen is this continuous improvement idea where you might do value stream mapping this year, and the first time you do it, you shave off weeks in processing time. And it's amazing. Everybody's just, you know, astounded can't believe it. Um, you do it maybe the next year and you're shaving off a day. And then you're doing it the third year and it might be you're shaving off hours in that process. But the idea is that you continue to do it to the point that there's nothing more to shave off in the process. It's as lean as it can be. It's all muscle. There's no fat. Um, so that's really important. Um, I think to, to consider is that you just don't do it once. And then the most difficult part is anchoring it into the institutional culture because you'll find that you bring people together they like these to brainstorm these wonderful ideas for improvement and then execution is where you really face a challenge um, when it comes time to to do the work to change the form to adjust the workflow you might then find that there's some resistance or um, it's not that you know not seen as urgent and, and so you want to work through that and there's a chapter on that as well Great, thanks for that the, the uh, detail and that encouragement, right? Um, and and to your comment about it's a continuous process, and that's just like any assessment or evaluation that you're doing. It's a continuous process uh, for it to get better. Um, in chapter seven, you talk about the organizational culture and the need to anchor change. You mentioned that a little bit. Could you elaborate on how that can be done and, you know, what strategies have you found to be successful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so different thoughts there. One is I think back to when I was a, a doctoral student at the University of Minnesota working on my dissertation. I remember um, one of the faculty on my committee, the advice was bring your committee along. Don't surprise them. Don't get these wonderful ideas and then show up with, look all the work I've done. Bring them along every step of the way. And that's something I you know, really have embraced over my career. Um, when you try to get colleagues across campus on board, you want to bring them along. And so the organizational culture, ways that I've done that um, around lead process improvement is like if you have staff who you're relying on to execute some of these tactics later on down the line, Send them for training on, you know, certification and lean management. Uh, there is a number, well, you know, there were a number of in-person opportunities pre-pandemic, and there's still some, you know, virtual opportunities. But send them. They don't necessarily need to hear from you. Sometimes they don't want to hear from you, um, but they can hear from an expert, uh, outside expert, who can train them. And, and being in a group setting with other colleagues from 
not just from other institutions, but from even other industries, other fields, uh, helps them to understand how this applies. They see that people really value this knowledge, value this work, and in some cases they hear about the success stories um, from other places. So that's one way to bring people along is, you know, it's great to have a chapter and talk about it at staff meeting every month, um, but probably the, the next best thing is if you have some professional development funds, send them to get some workshops on this um, or try to get one of the, you know, it might be a, a webinar that you can pay a few hundred dollars and the whole team can tune in from wherever it is they're working these days. Um, another example around the organizational culture and you know, trying to anchor change, UMBC, and I did this when I was at Montana State as well, is trying to get colleagues across campus to uh, engage in, in our field of international, you know, international education. Um, when the NASA annual conference was in DC, we had 32 individuals from UMBC and only six from my office. You know, these were deans, associate deans, faculties, all sorts of you know, individuals from various units across the campus. Did the same thing when it was in Philadelphia, it was close. And when I was at Montana State, I it would get delegations and we'd go, it was the Los Angeles conference. And so bringing people along, um, if you think about who the stakeholders are, and there's a, some you know, on that in, in, in the book as well on organizational, um, mapping, you know, stakeholder mapping and all, knowing who your stakeholders are and what type of stakeholders they are, uh, but bring them along. And then these changes will not just be seen as the strange idea that, you know, you are now putting forth because you have this, uh, this book in your hand or you heard about it on a webinar or so, but it's something that they bought into along the way um, by following those breadcrumbs as opposed to just pushing them forward into an unfamiliar environment. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, bringing people along often is, is part of the work we do, uh, regardless of what office you're in, I think. Uh, the advocacy piece is so strong, right? Um, that I think thinking of it as a whole system, uh, whole operation, if you will, is so critical. So in your book, um, you also reference a lot of, um, you know, processes and things, real life examples that you've gone through and implemented that are within the admissions office or the International Student Scholar Services office. Would there be uh, applicability for education abroad, for example, or other parts of, you know, within international education? Yes, you can apply these concepts to education abroad. You can apply these concepts to international partnership management. You can apply these concepts to organizing your dishwasher. Um, it can be applied all across the board. And, and again, it's not unique to higher ed. Um, it's, you know, it's come from through the military. It's come through manufacturing. It's come through uh, healthcare. Um, lean is it's what it is. It's, it's the time. We have lean times right now. I don't know about your budgets, but we have lean times and we want to be able to achieve more with less. And, you know, maybe if we do a, you know, second edition, um, maybe the book gets expanded to the different, uh, you know, knowledge communities making it more explicit because while the concepts may not change and the strategies may not change, um, it's just the examples. And I just chose the International Student Office um, to have a more coherent, uh, you know, application. But, yeah, you can take any of this and apply it all across the board to anything that you do. Great. And, and as you also alluded to earlier, you know, industries like hospital, um, medical care, as well as car manufacturers use this. And, and it's a practical mm -hmm. application that is directly connected to processes and things we do within international mm -hmm. education. So in terms of your research process for studying the Toyota production process, what parallels between IE office and Toyota met methods did you find? And that was a question submitted by our audience. Okay. So there's um, a body of literature on the Toyota production system, which many of these um, tools and techniques come out of. And that could be looking at um, like the Gemba walk, which is the idea of, you know, Gemba is the place. So if you're a journalist in Japan, you go to the Gimba, the place of the action. Where is it taking place? 
I don't speak Japanese. I just have these terminology because I've studied the, the Japanese management model. Anyway, um, so Gemba Walk is, is, you know, you literally walk the, the factory floor and you see the place of the activity. You're looking at the machines. You're talking with the um, people who are managing the machines. Now you're asking yourself now, how does this apply to international education? Well, you know, use another example from uh, international admissions, let's say, is, or let's do education abroad, just for the sake of keeping things interesting. So rather than, you know, your, your uh, colleagues may disagree, but education abroad is about enrollment management as well. You're recruiting students to participate in academic programs or other experiential learning activities. They're applying, you need to process those applications. Oftentimes there's this scholarship component piece you want the students, you want to, you know, have your yield be high enough that your faculty-led program budgets can actually at least uh, you know, break even, if not generate some sort of revenue. And then you want to retain the students. You don't want them getting abroad and the next day getting on a plane to come home. You also want happy alumni in the sense that they've studied abroad and wonderful experience and they're going to go, you know, seeing the, the praises of your office and you and programs you offer to, to other potential students. Um, so very similar to international student recruitment, to international enrollment management, but in the education abroad setting, if you were to you know, go to the GIMBA, um, walk through the process, you might actually, if you're the manager, you're the SIO, you're sitting down with your education abroad advisor um, as if you're a student yourself. And you're asking, what does it look like for that um, uh, kind of pre-advising piece? If there is some sort of a workshop that's offered, um, you sit, sit in on that, see what's said, take some notes, ask some questions. When there's the education abroad application, if you're using a system and, you know, whatever system it might be, I won't, you know, call out any vendors, but um, you might ask for, uh, if there's a sandbox version to submit a, um, a fake application, you know, a test application for you. So you can literally see what is the process. If I'm a student and I'm walking through this and I want to study abroad, what screens am I seeing? What information am I receiving? Are there any sort of automated, automated emails that are firing off at that point? Is there anything that's confusing or is it so clunky I just want to, you know, walk away from this? Um, thinking about how the credentials are evaluated, you sit down with your education abroad advising team if they do the evaluations of returning study abroad students and you might ask, well, how are you, you know, getting at this conversion factor? What tools are you, you know, using, basing your decision on? Uh, what resources uh, to ensure that we're being consistent in how we, we um, transfer these credits back into the university system, into the university um, student information system, transcript, what have you. So that would be an example of being at the GEMBA and, and like walking through the process. It's not just sitting at your desk and asking questions or having someone provide you with a report. It's literally you got to get up and you got to walk and you got to go sit down where the action's taking place. Look at those screens and Banner and PeopleSoft and Teradata, whatever it is that you're using, um, and then ask questions along the way. And you know, there's the five why type of questions you might ask, and those are again included uh, in the book as well. Thank you. Um... That makes total sense to me, but it's also because I've read the book a couple of times now um, as we went through the, the whole process with you, David. You know, I, I want to reassure the audience. I mean, you've used a lot of very um, unique words mm -hmm. to lean uh, management that we often are not exposed to in international mm -hmm. education, like Kaizen, Gamba, and all, all those words, right? And, and I'll be honest, don't be intimidated. It may take you a couple of times to, to learn the concepts, but once you do, it's great uh, in terms of systems thinking application. So one of the words you use is the loop uh, in systems thinking. Can you give an example of a successful loop in the, the international office? Yeah, um, a successful loop might be Let's think about student recruitment. And um, I was trying to think outside of that, but let's, let's start with student recruitment because I've used a lot of examples in the book themselves. And let's say you work with uh, third party recruiters. You work with you know, commission based recruiters, you work with agents. And it might be that um, a successful loop would be that you're getting the student coming to you, you're paying the invoice on time 
keeping the agent satisfied. You're paying at what's considered a market rate for institutions that are similar to yours. And you continue to get more students because of that. The students are happy. It's feeding into that loop. Um, a less than successful loop would be that you get your invoice from your favorite agent and you take six months to make the payment. And they say, hey, you know, uh, we got bills to pay on this side over here. I got counselors, I got to pay their salaries, I got light bills and other things. Um, you make the payment and the students find that maybe what you were promising was not, you know, what they expected. And they start transferring out. And again, that agent says, hey, you know, I'm trying to get students to go be successful alumni for you, not just students enrolling, um, not satisfied there. And eventually that partnership breaks down and you don't have students. So understanding what feeds the loop, um, you know, I think there's a number of real life examples that we can think about of, um, I, I hesitate to get into some of them that we see on the news these days, but um, of what might have contributed to success or not. Um, but every, you know, again, everything's a system and understanding how do you move that system uh, you don't want to, you know, Peter Singer would say you don't push the system because the system always pushes back harder. You will get, you know, overwhelmed every time. But if you can find these levers, uh, the right lever to pull, you can, in a judo type way, cause the system to, in its own momentum, to shift in a direction that you want it to shift. And that can have a direct impact on your education abroad, on the success of your international partnerships, on your um, allocation of resources. Uh, on the performance of your staff, there's there's information on there about uh, even you know uh, employee skills matrix ways you could you could utilize that um, to build up organizational capacity. Um, so yeah, find the you know I think chapter one I think gets into some of these tools for identifying systems, talks about some of the loops, and as you understand that concept a bit more, try to look for them in your work, try to identify them. Um, don't try to change them initially, just try to identify, just spot them. And as you start to label them, identify them, then you can start analyzing what's feeding the loop in a good way or a bad way. And what are some of those levers that are at your disposal that maybe previously you were unaware existed. Great. Thank you. So um, thanks for all the questions that are coming in. I have the next one from Connie. I can imagine that some people may be taken aback at having someone sit down with them to go through the entire application process, for example, right? What are some ways to disarm people to get their buy-in? So um, again, if you follow the um, Toyota production system model, it's all about also you show respect. You're not the um, you know, inspector general going into somebody's office space and looking over their shoulder and questioning everything that they do. What you're doing is you're showing interest and you're saying that you want to, you want them to teach you. So you're the student in this case. You want them to teach you what they do and how they do it and why they do it. But you're not the, the manager or the supervisor who's going in and with the uh, magnifying glass and scrutinizing everything. Because what you'll find is that then people start to show you behaviors that they think you want to see. Um, and then you walk away and they go back to doing what they previously, you know, normally might have done. But you got to show respect and it's important to have a, typically you'd have a meeting before you have like a gimbal walk um, about who's going to participate, what's the point of this exercise, uh, and try to disarm people that way so that they don't feel that, you know, they're going to get written up if you know, you don't like the way that they're processing X, Y, Z. And, and when you're meeting with them, that's not the time to start giving them recommendations on ways they should change, you know, what have you. You really want to be asking questions from them. They're the experts on the job that they do. Um, and have them start to question maybe uh, if there's something that you, you question, can you have them to start questioning why it's done that way as opposed to telling them it shouldn't be done that way. So show respect. It's important. That's a very valid point, right? That you're not the inspector coming in with a whip and 
writing them up for anything like that, but empowering them to see differently because we're all set in our ways and comfortable. And after a while, we may get complacent and overlook some of these things. And I think that's the point of, you know, implementing some of these uh, systems thinking and lean management. So talking lean and is easy. Just, Go ahead, David. Yeah, I was just going to say one other way to do this, depending on the dynamics in your office, because you always want to adapt right, to the system in which you're operating. And it might be that you know, depending on the relationships you have with staff, that it would be too intimidating for someone in a management type position to go in um, into someone's space asking how they're doing it. So you, the next best thing is you think about cross training. And so you have someone at their level who might be in a different uh, unit or a different part of the international office. Maybe it's an education abroad advisor and a DSO sitting down and, and talking to each other about you know, what they do and cross training and present that framework. And then their peer also asks questions and comes up with, you know, ideas, why, you know, why this, why that, and trying to understand it. And it can be a nice debrief at that point. So it's not the, um, you know, the vice provost or the vice president of global international whatever, who's sitting down, you know, with the um, entry level staff member. You might just do it in a peer setting and, you know, frame it as cross training. Yes, cross-training is another component that takes time as well, right? So as, as you think about lean, David, um, cross-training is one component, but also um, more importantly, how do you make the case for setting aside time to do this implementation? So um, I think I share the example in the book uh, at a unnamed former institution of mine. I had an unnamed former staff member of mine who, um, yeah, that's usually the resistance you get. We don't have time. We're too busy, too busy to, to do any you know, lean or reflection on our work. And that's usually the first um, wall of resistance that you will encounter. And I think anytime someone says they're too busy, that's the very rationale for wanting to focus on lean. You're, you're too busy. You, you know, if you're overworked, if you're operating in the red, we need to change that. We want to, really what we want to do here is see how we can not have you do more, but again, have you, you know, work less hard and achieve, you know, the more, you know, greater results. And for the example that, again, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure I shared in the book at this point, I, I'd have to look it up. But when we did this, um, assessment, let's say, uh, of our admissions process. At that time, at that institution, um, the international office was on one side of campus, admissions was on another side of campus. And because of the processes and because it was the way it was always done, and you know, that's usually a, a rationale for why we continue to do things, um, the application, you know, international application, would basically go to admissions, they would get print out the online application because the international admission counselor didn't have access to the system. So they had to go literally walk across campus, pick it up, bring it back to the international office. They do their credential evaluation. They decide about should this person be admitted. Then they take it back to the admissions office. The admissions office would code it into the system. And all of this, you know, added delays. And when we did the analysis, because like value stream mapping, you literally map it out and um, quantify it by the minute. I had a staff member who 20% uh, of her week was walking across campus with these files. 20% of her job was literally walking across campus. Uh, that was something we never would have known had we not, you know, dug into this and taken the time. And then what we got I mean, with that argument, going to you know, explain this, we got access to that, um, that online system and there was no longer the need to walk across campus twice a day um, and, you know, pick up documents, drop off documents, all that sort of thing. Now, the next wall of resistance was an employee enjoyed walking across campus and shooting the breeze with some of the friends in the admissions office and that went away because there was no longer a reason for it. So maybe that's a downside to lean. Um, but you know, I think each institution is different. Great. In the last five minutes, I have a couple of just comments that people have put in appreciating sharing, um, you know, their experiences. For example, Amy talks about 
um, bringing in an outside perspective where she recently had a group of MBA students observe the application review process for their Six Sigma course. And it was enlightening to her, right, mm -hmm. that you invite outside perspectives. And I think you bring the, a lot of that um, into your book as well. And Connie also in the chat had shared that her IT folks, um, I think the IT office has a focus on lean, regularly sends out information and helpful hints to campus. So that's a great source of information for her on her campus, but you may have untapped resources on your campus as you alluded to earlier, David, right? Um, so in the last couple of minutes, David, do you have any parting thoughts for the audience today? I would just say if you haven't picked up a copy, uh, go ahead and order one. Um, uh, you know, the way it works with NASA, I don't make any money off of book sales. So I'm just telling you, order it. It's, a, you know, it's something for the profession, for the good of the field. So pick it up, um, check it out, you know, start working on some. Don't try to do everything at once. Um, you know, I think people can know how to find me. If you have questions, I'm always happy to answer those, um, email, LinkedIn, whatever, um, or when we're back in person at conferences, um, you know, go, go Denver. Um, so yeah, just, just get a book and check it out. Great, thank you. So we were just alerted that the uh, coupon code for the book does not work. We're on it and ready and we'll send out messages to all the ones who attended today with an update on that. I really truly appreciate your time, David, you know, spent with us this afternoon sharing insights and experiences implementing lean management concepts and also just showing us how to improve our processes and efficiencies. And, and as you also mentioned, it goes a long way to improving serving students uh, and the International Education Committee. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thanks to the audience for submitting your questions. Uh, lots of congratulations to you, David, for a really good publication that's relevant and timely and appreciate everyone. The recording will be available in the next day or two. You'll get an email notification about it as well. So please spread the love and information and share this. And as David talked about earlier, you know, start small. I love the concept of doing this a chapter at a time with your staff uh, and then start implementing those efficiencies. Thank you. Have a good afternoon or evening. Thanks everyone, good luck.